Good afternoon, good morning, um, good day, depending on where you're at. Uh, today's webinar will talk about code optimization and the platform technology we've been building here at Atom over the years. And there's going to be this beautiful uh, case study by Medicargo um, and be presented by Pierre Olivier Lavoie. We um, hopefully will be able to talk generally about the technology platform, also showcase how it's been applied specifically for Medicargo, and then have some open-ended discussion on where this technology may fall uh, over time. <clears throat> so next slide, please. So of course, recombinant protein expression is the key driver for basically every single step in, in biotechnology today, all from antibodies, food industry, hormones, vaccines, and so on. How do you design a protein from one original natural source into a commercial system where you actually produce metric tons of this molecule of interest, or maybe for gene therapy application, how do you convert a gene that is supposed to express well in certain context in a certain cell line to some other completely different context in another cell line. So at the end of the day, uh, we really see code optimization and, and, and redesigning of the coding sequence being a key driver for the entire industry across spectrum. Um, so with that introduction, I'd be happy to have uh, Dr. Pierre Olivier here to talk a little bit about Medicargo and put this into context. Thanks, Claes. Uh, so who are we uh, at Medicago? So we have um, more than 20 years of experience and uh, develop a unique plant-based technology. Uh, currently, we have 450 plus uh, employees that are on two production sites. Uh, we have five vaccine candidates in the clinical pipeline and uh, for now more than 27,000 persons that have, have received uh, our vaccine. Next, please. So like I said, uh, we have two manufacturing operational facility and a third one is currently uh, under construction. Uh, the first uh, is in Quebec City uh, where it's all a start. And uh, we also have a commercial facility in North Carolina. Uh, the capacity is estimated at 80 uh, million doses of a monovalent vaccine. And we have the potential to double this capacity at 190 million doses. But uh, by 2024, uh, with the third uh, facility, we will have uh, more than 1 billion doses capacity. Of course, it's all depend on dosage and yield, and it's uh, why we are talking today. Uh, next, please. So uh, at Medicago, we use a plant that is called Nicotiana Bentamiana, and it's used uh, as a bioreactors to produce virus-like particle. Uh, this is a plant uh, very common in Australia, it is uh, wi widely used in plant virology because uh, it can be infected by almost every plant viruses. Uh, it has a weak, what we call a weak immune system, uh, which that means that the genetic material can be uh, successfully um, inserted in the host and not rejected. And it is very important to note that it's not uh, the same plant used for uh, production of tobacco. It's uh, nicotine tobacco in the case of tobacco and we use Bentamiana. Next, please. So the, the technology is called Proficia. Uh, it's, uh, I'll start with uh, DNA synthesis. Uh, with uh, When we have the candidate vaccine, we just uh, make the gene synthesized. Uh, it is assembled and uh, inserted into uh, the plant by using vacuum infiltration and uh, a bacteria called agrobacterium. Uh, the plant is then uh, returned into the greenhouse, uh, in, uh, not, not the greenhouse, in grow chamber, uh, incubated for four to uh, six days, harvested, and the various light particle or VLP uh, are purified from there. And uh, we got this uh, VLP, which is called various light particle, because it mimics uh, the structure of a real virus, but it's not infectious at the end. You can uh, go to the link uh, to see the whole process. So uh, what was the case before coming to Atom? Uh, we, we used uh, gene optimization, but it, it was uh, with uh, freely available software. Um, like you can see uh, in the upper gel, it, it worked pretty good for the most viral target. 
So here uh, it's a kuma sustained uh, plant of crude extract uh, from native, uh, which is the red circle, and optimize uh, the VP1 gene. So it's the major structural protein from norovirus. So you can see that we have a, a very good improvement. But uh, the problem uh, when you can see uh, with the Western blood, it's, it's, it's the optimization is very variable and we, it's not possible, uh, it was not possible to, uh, to predict which one uh, would be the best one. So again, it is uh, Western blood. It, uh, you can see we have three optimized genes using the same method and the three genes uh, don't, don't uh, lead to the same optimization. Um, so the question was, uh, can we have a predictive model so we went into a research collaboration with Atom uh, with in using the Gene GPS program. Uh, and the goal was to develop an algorithm that could predict uh, which sequence will work the best in our system. Uh, and uh, by doing that, uh, of course, maximizing the sequence diversity uh, to capture the preference of our system. Uh, the project was separated into three phases. So the first one was using Dasher fluorescent protein because it's, it's easily measured and uh, we thought that the expression should not be limiting in, in the plant system. Uh, the second one, uh, the second phase was with the influenza hemagglutinin uh, because at the time it was the main uh, vaccine product uh, from secreted uh, virus-like particle. And a third phase uh, was to apply this developed system uh, to norovirus VP1 uh, structural protein, which, is, uh, which was a vaccine uh, in development. Uh, here at Medicago. I think it's uh, your turn. This is, where, this is where I come in. So, so this is Mark Welch um, taking over for Pierre Olivier. So we started working with Olivier on this, this problem. Uh, we, had, we had done some work and I'll describe some of that, um, applying uh, our gene GPS technology to other systems um, uh, before, uh, Pierre, uh, Pierre Olivier came to us. And I'll, you know, let me start by just sort of introducing the, the codon optimization uh, problem as a whole. And, and we even like to, we often avoid the, the word optimization and the reason is described in the slide. The, the coding sequence, the possible coding sequence for an average protein is, is, is hugely vast. It's a normal protein, a protein of average amino acid content and length. Um, can be coded in, in far more ways than there are particles in the universe. It's, it's, we're never gonna sample all this space. It's not a matter of finding the exact perfect sequence, or if you do, you, you'll have to, to, uh, to reduce the variables down to something that's manageable. Um, and so the question is, do we know what those variables are? And, and we got into this business, uh, the gene synthesis business uh, 20 years ago, which, um, and we found out pretty quick, and, it's, and it agrees with what Pierre Levé was showing you, that uh, standard uh, thinking and optimization was unpredictable. So we would start delivering genes to people and they would get various results and we didn't know why. And, and so we, we embarked on a study to, to figure out you know, really uh, what are the important variables and, and which ones aren't, because if we can't reduce the variable space, we're not going to ever be able to sample so many possibilities. Um, some of the things that may be uh, uh, at play and are, are all uh, across the map. I mean, you can, you know, codon bias uh, is one that comes up, uh, comes up a lot relative codon bias. Um, codon pairs, adjacent codons have, have been invoked in the literature. The number of cases, RNA structures, internal uh, or some binding site structures, um, GC content, things that affect RNA stability, many different things can affect and probably all do affect uh, to some extent uh, uh, expression levels that you get. So how do you balance all these? In some cases, they may be competing in terms of the codons you use um, uh, to, to design in, in your gene design. So how do you navigate through all these, these uh, different effects on your, on your gene to figure out what is best for, for expression? So that's what Gene GPS is about: is to try to to uh, efficiently navigate all these various possibilities with as with a reasonable test set of number uh, test set of genes. You don't want to. We can't sample a Google genes, um, but we can sample some 
reasonable number in the lab, hundreds perhaps, um, can we can we from a hundreds understand what the most important variables are, at least reduce the the unpredictability enough that we can apply this uh, in the real world. So, so part of that, uh, part of the logic of this, the methodology in, in GGPS is illustrated on this slide. It's if we're going to sample as many possibilities as possible with a reasonable number of test genes, we need to sample, um, we need to minimize the amount of, of uh, co-variation between variables in our, in our set. We want to maximize the diversity and in our, in our test gene sets, um, um, in all the variables that we care about interrogating. And, and I can back up a little here. And what we're doing in Gene GPS is we're making a test set of genes, we call them infologs, that are designed to, to interrogate the host. So if we were to just say uh, addressing, addressing what the codon usage bias preferences would be of a host, we would design a test set of genes that sample broadly uh, codon bias um, and then feed those to, to the host, express those genes under uh, ideally um, uh, real world application uh, production conditions, maybe in fermenters um, under, you know, in, in rich media and see what you get. Um, um, to do that, you know, and we want to, we leverage what, our, uh, what we can do with gene synthesis. We can create exact gene sequences. We can create them so that, that there's minimal co-variation in both the sequence diversity and the code and usage diversity so we can maximize the information we're going to get out of these. What's shown in this slide is a comparison of a, of a, of a library that's created by randomizing oligos and assembling them for the same purpose of interrogating a host uh, in, the, in a published work. Um, and, the, and, and below is shown, shown one of the gene sets that we would create using GGPS for the same protein. And you can see on the sequence diversity level, there's a lot of clustering uh, in the randomized oligo library. And it's mostly because there are biases in how these libraries self-assemble. But if we're designing the genes to be as different as possible from each other, we get almost a perfect distribution. There's no clustering in that set at all. So if we do see variation in those genes, we can, we can, we're, we, we are more likely to identify uh, what the important differences are, the ones that are, are related to expression. Likewise, if we're looking at a different level of diversity, if we look at codon usage, you know, what these heat maps are showing uh, are, are the relative correlations in codon usage uh, bias, so the frequency occurrence of, of different codons, and each each row or column is a is a particular codon, and the color indicates the degree to which a pair of codons correlate positively or negatively across the gene set. So what you want is no correlation. You want uh, a sampling such that, that if you see some variation, say, in, a, in lysine codons, that you know that it's lysine codons that matter. You don't want correlation between lysine codons and those codons from another amino acid such that you can't distinguish whether it's, you know, whether it's one uh, set of codons or another. So, so the interlock set you see has much less red and blue. It has much less covariation between uh, the frequency usage of codons. So we're really broadly sampled in, in codon usage. So if we can learn something in the interlock set, we're more likely to, to be able to identify the variables that are important. And we're sampling a broader space uh, in terms of sequence uh, diversity. So when we applied this first, this is published work from, from quite a while ago. Um, uh, in PLOS one that I'm showing here, um, we, we applied the, the approach to, to a set of genes in E. coli. We made a, an infolog set for a single chain antibody and a, and a DNA polymerase uh, diversified in primarily codon usage. Um, and, and what we saw right off the bat was that, that the, the range of expression that we got um, shown on the y-axis on the left plot here doesn't correlate or didn't correlate with traditional uh, optimization uh, uh, thinking. So the x-axis here is the codon adaptation index. Codon adaptation is, is the standard or had been the standard for, for gene optimization. It's the relative use of, of uh, uh, it's relative use of codons most highly used 
in highly expressed genes of an organism. So if you, it's a bit of an arbitrary cutoff, but if genes that are expressed highly, uh, if they have a bias in their codon usage relative to other genes, um, it's the uh, most, uh, uh, the highest codon adaptation uh, ranked codons are the ones that are highly, most highly frequent in those highly expressed genes. Uh, if you're using just that most frequent codon uh, all throughout your gene for every amino acid, you'd have a codon adaptation of one. Um, what we saw is no correlation with, with that index at all across our set. In fact, uh, most of our, our best genes of these in absolute level are expressing um, for these two shown here are expressing at two to 300 micrograms per mil. Um, we saw, saw, saw intermediate codon adaptation genes outperforming our high codon adaptation index genes. So, so really no support for traditional optimization, a lot of variation at every level of codon adaptation. So something else must be, must be going on. But when we did uh, model the data, so we had a systematic very uh, set, we could use machine learning methods to, to look at the, at the impact of different codon biases and other factors on the, on the variation we saw, we were able to, to make sense of it. And that's shown on the right. So for the red and blue data are for the same gene set. Um, and we can actually add in a third set, um, um, a, a, a set of genes for a fluorescent protein and build a model that can explain the variation uh, that we see for all of them. And that model, it turns out, is largely based on codon usage. It's just a different view of codon usage than what the codon adaptation index gives you. Um, so we were able to make sense of the data. Now, if you go to us, um, we've done this for, for other genes beyond these three now in, in E. coli, but if you go to us now for, for uh, you know, gene optimization, if you order a gene, um, our algorithms are based on, on what we've learned in this type of modeling work. It's, it's, it, they're based on what we learned about what works in real world uh, expression systems, not based on some theory about, about how to apply biases seen in nature um, to gene design. We're, we're just asking what works when you, when you try to express a gene in BL21 in a, behind a strong uh, promoter and under ideal expression conditions, this is what you want in your gene. It works according to these models. Um, so one thing that comes up often when we um, uh, when we make these gene sets um, uh, is whether the effects that we're seeing are, are based on on what we call global variables or or local variables. I said that previous model is largely code on usage based. Code on usage. When I say code on usage, we're talking about a global formula where we're just talking about the frequency usage of each codon. We're not talking about uh, positional effects, um, codon choice in individual positions. We're not talking about RNA structures at particular positions. Um, but there are many examples in the literature where there are local effects, particularly RNA structure at the five prime end comes up a lot in prokaryotic systems. Um, so one thing that we'll often do um, as a follow-up for an initial um, change GPS set is, is look at uh, the impact of local or local effects as well. And we can take the genes that we created in our original set and make hybrids of those and see if there's any correlation with position. Um, and this is just one example from that same uh, gene set for the, for the polymerase. We took a low expressor in red here and a high expressor in, in gray, and we made hybrids for three different positions. We split into three positions. We made all the combinations of the three segments. And what we saw in, in this case, and what we've seen predominantly, certainly throughout the, the coli set, is, is, uh, is distribution of the, of the effects. And if you followed along here, you'd see that none, no single piece explains the full expression. You need all three gray pieces to get 100% expression, to get the expression as, as high as variant 19 here. And it's certainly not confined just to the, to the to the five or to the end terminus of the five prime end of the gene, the ribosome uh, uh, with a translational initiation site. So, in fact, we see a, a significant impact of the, of the three prime end of the gene. So, so distrib distributed effects that's in line with what we saw in the model. I told you that that a lot of our effects were dependent on codon usage. That's consistent with what we're seeing here. 
but in some cases we may identify local effects and we can use this, this kind of approach to identify where those are and, and maybe learn more about uh, uh, gene design, uh, deleterious motifs to avoid, et cetera, um, that we can apply in future uh, design work. Um, so, so obviously when we, when we I, I emphasize that we want you know, something that works in real world applications, most of our test sets are not all going into large scale you know, fermenters. Um, we're hoping that, that what we learn uh, in our modeling work will translate to, uh, uh, to large scale. And this is an example here where we made a, a set of five genes that we uh, predicted to, to rank from low to high. We provided them to Lanza, uh, who's interested in, in this particular protein. They scaled those up at, at large scale and, and they, they reproduced exactly the rank order that we, that we predicted and we saw in, in our small scale. And so, so we know that our models are are applicable to large scale product production. Okay, so, so we wanted to take this now to, to other organisms. So we did our, our initial study in coli. Um, certainly there's a lot of interest in, in, in other uh, production hosts. We'll talk more about, uh, about uh, Leucotiana in, in the later part of our talk. Um, but our next step uh, at Adam was to, to apply this to uh, uh, to expression of mammalian hosts, and an example of that is shown here, um, where we've taken a, we've started from a protein that we call Dasher, it's the GFP. We made 48 uh, versions of Dasher. Uh, this matrix here is a, it's a matrix of codon uh, usage tables uh, that we use to create the sets. So every it's a design of experience type uh, uh, a construction where where basically there's minimal covariation between the codon usage for each of the amino acids across the set. So they're not correlated. And like I said before, we wanna have minimal co-variation to learn the most we can about the contribution of codon usage for each of the amino acids independently. So then we, then we measured by fax the fluorescence uh, for each of these variants. And we generated the blue data shown here. So that's round one of the, of the, of the work. We then took that information, we could build a model uh, as I showed like I showed you for the coli work, we build a model with machine learning on the data. It tells us what's good and what's bad. And we can use that data to predict a new set. Um, to, we're sampling over some range for round one. We can now sample over an improved range. We can bias our genes toward things that the model sets are important. And that's the red set here. So we created another set of genes, uh, but now biased according to what the first round told us would be good. And you can see the improvement. We we moved up. Our best genes are about threefold better than the than the best from from round one, and we moved the entire population um, as well. So you can see that you know we we're definitely learning as we iterate you know rounds in the process. We could potentially continue this. Um, and to date, you know we've done this. We've expanded beyond just the Dash or GFP. We've we've applied gene GPS to many different types of proteins. In mammalian cells, uh, antibodies, uh, membrane proteins. And so, so they've ranged from from cytoplasmic uh, targeted to secreted to membrane proteins. And we actually have a combined model that that uh, uh, can predict the expression for for all of those together. And we actually see a lot of similarity between uh, the preferences of Cho versus HEK. All right. Uh, and another interesting uh, layer to this uh, is just looking at the at the differences host to host. So um, I told you before that we didn't see that uh, uh, couldn't we couldn't uh, obviously predict the rank order of genes based on traditional um, uh, traditional uh, protein expression uh, thought, um, whether it's the host bias. Um, uh, or you know, the, the codon bias for highly expressed genes. Um, the question then is, you know, one question is, you know, do different hosts have different preferences? And clearly they do. Um, um, and this is an example here, where we've taken the same set of Dasher genes in this case, and we've expressed them in E. coli uh, and in HEK and in SF9 uh, baclovirus, uh, that, that latter work being done in collaboration with Aldebron. Um, and, and what you see here is, is no two systems correlate. Um, 
And there, but there are some, some interesting genes that are, you, they're not exclusive. They're genes that, that perform well in, in, in all three hosts, the, um, the green uh, data point is an example. And then there's some genes that, that perform well in two of the three and some that are just bad in all three. Um, if there you know, is an application where you might be interested in, in a gene that can cross over, you know, it's possible for us to use the GGPS information to, to you know, bridge that gap to find an overlap in terms of the preferences between hosts. All right, so, so today, this is just a subsample. We've done over 50 different hosts uh, now, um, and they range from, from you know, uh, insect cells, as I've shown, to, to multiple yeasts, multiple bacteria, and we've done some work in, in corn um, and, and other fungal systems. Uh, we, did, we did a mushroom in one case. We had good models in, in, in all these cases um, and, and now we, what we really wanted to do is, is see if we can just leverage what we've done before and to, to help out uh, the Metacargo team. And, and, and to start that, we started basically in the same place I showed you for our, our uh, uh, mammalian work. We had a, a set of Dasher genes. Um, this is a slightly different set of Dasher genes, but the logic is the same. Um, diversified primarily in codon usage, handed them off to Pierre Olivier's team, and they measured expression and saw a sevenfold difference from the bottom to the top uh, in expression. And that's the good sign. We always we want to see that. We want to see that the expression system is limited by um, by codon usage. Now the question is, what are the limitations or what factors in the codon usage and in, in the coding of the genes, I should say, uh, is uh, is yielding a sevenfold difference. So initially, we look at codon usage as as always, um, because that's what we've mainly focused in our in our test set uh, in our design, um, and we and we can see code variation. We can get a model. It's um, one that should show here. There's a it's a new layer of information. There's two sets of data. Uh, there's the blue data, which is our model. And then there's the red data, which, which is cross-validation data. What cross-validation data is, 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 um, is what the model uh, predicts for left out data. Basically what you do is you take your data set, you remove 10% of the data and you predict that 10% um, from the remaining 90% from a model built on the remaining 90%. What you want is a model that's, that's robust to, to, that predicts well with left out data. Um, so it's oversampled enough, and 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 you and you, you know, you you are confident that you can predict new genes from from that model. Um, we have a pretty decent model here. The significance is is very high. Um, there is some variation, as you can see when you look at the red data, uh, that we can't explain. So so as always, um, in these situations, we we wonder if there are other variables. Uh, they could be local, as I just as I discussed before, local variables, and, uh, uh, RNA structures, uh, uh, RNA processing motifs, et cetera. Uh, there could be other global variables that we haven't considered in the, in the modeling itself. So uh, what we often do is the next step is what we call kitchen sink um, uh, variable selection. We, we, we basically uh, characterize the gene set in, in just about anything you can think of. It can be RNA structure over windows. Um, it can be in GC content in windows, uh, codon usage by position, a number of different, different ways we can look at sequence um, and see if anything uh, else shows up, anything that strongly correlates uh, with, uh, with the variation that we're seeing in expression. The idea isn't to necessarily um, build a, a, a final model from these data, but to figure out whether there are new variables that we can add to further uh, uh, designs for more exploration. Um, so further rounds of GPS, but we can certainly find uh, uh, variables from this type of search and apply them to a working model that we can, that we can see predicts expression of new genes as well. So that's what we did uh, in the case of our first Dasher model uh, in the in the Metcado 
map cargo system. And you can see on the left is our first model just on code on usage. When we, when we do variable selection and looking for additional variables, we, we do identify a, a handful of, of things weren't, that we didn't consider that were very quite, quite thoroughly across the set that we can add uh, to the model to, to better predict our, our data. And you can see the red data now is a lot tighter. Um, so it's a much more predictive model. To further, to fully validate that model, what we would like to do is either apply it to new proteins um, or do a second round of, of GPS where we're focused on diversifying those new variables intentionally to see if, if, um, if their impact, um, uh, in, if their impact agrees with what we're, what we're uh, uh, identified in, in this first round of variable selection. Okay, so, so this is the second phase. So as, as so we have a model for, for Dasher and as Pierre Olivier suggested, the next phase was, was now applying what we learned to actual molecules of interest at, at Metacago. And, and, and in this case, that was hemagglutinin, influenza hemagglutinin. Um, so we did the, basically the same thing. We took, using some information from our Dasher model, we, we built a new, uh, 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 design set of, of HA coding vari variants um, and, and went through the same process. And this is the end result here. We have a wide range of expression levels and we can predict the, that range of expression levels from, from uh, sequence variables um, um, of, that, of that coding set. Um, so, so looking good. And now we have two proteins that we've, we have data for. And then the last phase, is is seeing whether we can apply what we've learned um, to those to to improving expression for a third protein in this case the norovirus pp1 um, and, and in this case instead of instead of building a, a a new gps round test set we just applied the current working algorithm the algorithm that's derived from the the model that we did on the previous uh, work uh, to norovirus uh, pp1 genes we made a number of different genes, uh, varied in, in a few different ways that the model suggested would be good, and and Metacago tested them versus their original uh, optimized gene, optimized by a, by a standard uh, uh, optimization scheme. That's shown on the on the left here, normalized to one here, and you can see all the the variants that we made. This you know, B1 through through uh, through the last it's covered for me. B1 through 12 here are, are all significantly improved uh, versus the original and up to sevenfold for the best. So that's that's where we're where we stand. I mean, it, it looks like uh, you know we've we've made good progress in terms of uh, you know, more reliably being able to improve genes uh, using the algorithms that came out of the, the first couple rounds of our of our work here. And and as with all this GPS work, we you know. Can always continue to do this more, refine the, you know, learn more about the variables that are uh, that are more important. Uh, learn to apply this to, to to different proteins to to better improve uh, metacognitive capability to produce a material in in Nicosia. And with that, I'll leave you. And we have questions. Well, it's, it's Mark, it's good. How how good can you make this? I mean, how how well does this model the perfect gene? How well does it model the perfect gene? Yeah. So you know, it's always a, a question of what the perfect gene is. Um, so you know, until you see, and, and there could be, and there, and there could be other limitations in the system, right? So so until you see it run into a wall where you where you you, you model, say I showed you the multiple rounds, the iterations that we did with Dasher and in the, in the mammalian system. In that system, we, we, we still haven't with Dasher hit a wall. Um, we don't know how far we can go before the system itself sets a limit. In E. coli, you know, we've, we've never been able to, to express beyond uh, three to 400 micrograms per mil in a small batch culture. Um, and we've, we reliably get to that level with with you know, virtually all our, our optimized genes now. So, you know, there's probably no, not, not much further we can go there. Um, at some point that's, 
that's the problem. It's it's the limitation of the system uh, becomes something other than codon usage. It's not necessarily that your gene isn't optimal. It's just that your gene is so good that some it's not limiting anymore. And that could be different with a different system. So, so yeah, in the case of Nicotiana, we, we don't have any data that says we've hit a limit yet. Pierre Olivier, do you know how far you expect to be able to, what was sort of the upper range of uh, what you expect to see in, in your plant-based system when it comes to yield? Do you have any data? Yeah, unfortunately, it's not possible to, uh, to disclose this, uh, this information, but let's say that uh, for Dasher, we have a, a lot less uh, limitation and we, we push it very, very far with the optimization. Um, and so are you now do you see how this can be now applied across the, the platform or do you see that different types of proteins have certain different kinds of requirements um we don't know exactly what for the algorithm but of course uh the more the bigger your protein is and the more complex the structure is you will have more uh more limitation. So at some point you have protein folding, you have uh, post-transactional uh, modification, you have glycosylation that can affect protein stability. So um, it, it was very important for us to start with a simple protein and to try the system. But you, you've seen that even with HA, which is a, a pretty complex protein, it's a trimer with a lot of glycan. So it, it uh, requires a, a lot of modification. And, uh, and the algorithm could push the, the expression pretty, uh, pretty high. And, and you, um, I don't know if you can disclose this, but have you, have you tried on different, different promoters and different vectors and see if, if your, the rank order, for instance, is retained in a different expression uh, context? I don't know if you've done those kind of work or, or if you're able to disclose any of that. Uh, it, it was done for, for the, uh, the, the more, more interesting protein, but uh, unfortunately it, it cannot be disclosed. But of course we have tried this with the HA and, uh, and norovirus. And, and what's your experience in, on that in, in other organisms, Mark? Yeah. And, no, 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 Sorry. please go ahead. Yeah. Maybe. So we certainly have seen that the load on the system um, can affect the rank order of genes. So, and that's why you know, earlier I emphasized, you know, we want solutions that apply to real world application. And if that's if that's full bore, um, you know, strong promoter under you know fast growth conditions, you know, it might not be the same. You might not see the same rank order if you're expressing the genes under tightly controlled. Uh, conditions and it may be there may be cases where okay, for for a membrane or secreted protein you want tightly controlled for the efficiency of, of targeting to the membrane or secretion and and you might see a different uh, rank order in that case but for example in E. coli though um, if we can vary we have vectors here uh, that we can vary the strength of the promoter the copy number of the vector the strength of the RBS and we've tested um, uh, genes that rank um, from high to low under a high load um, situation. So a high copy, strong promoter, uh, strong RBS, uh, uh, all in, you know, all grown in rich media and a, and a robust strain and, and compared those under different conditions with different RBS strengths, different promoter strengths, um, different copy number. And what we see is as the differences we see at high load, you can, um, um, are, well, the difference between the genes become more apparent as we go to higher and higher load. And for the most part, that's, that's uh, independent of what type of load. Excuse me. Uh, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> uh, webinar fun. Yeah, the, what, what we think is that the, uh, <clears throat> That the load is is basically related to to the flux through the translation machinery. 
So anything that increases the net, you know, RNA on ribosomes, the amount of tRNAs that are being consumed for your particular protein is, is gonna is going to put the stress on codon bias in particular that that we're seeing in our algorithms. <clears throat> so so yeah, high load is different from low load. If you if you have a single copy gene in a you know with a weak promoter, you know, you might not see the same rank order as, as you would when you when you're trying to make as much as possible. Well, I think we'll still see, but uh, even now, biotech's been been around for a while. I think there's still a lot of um, opportunities to engineer biological systems on a, on a translational velocity perspective, on transcription, on replicon, number of copies, all these different parameters. Um, but um, I really want to thank uh, Pierre Olivier for uh, showing this very cool um, unpublished data, and and it's amazing to see the power of your biological system. So thank you very much for doing that. Thank you, Clay. And uh, thank you, Mark, for going through the science. Um, so with that, I appreciate you taking the time and uh, hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you.